you so much for coming on the show. Uh, great to meet you. This is how we meet each other nowadays. Although, uh, like we were saying earlier, uh, it, it's changing. So we may be able to meet in person someday. So that'd be great. So why don't you tell wait. us a little about yourself and your organization and what you're passionate about? Sure. So my name is Elise Kay. I am a four-time founder. Uh, I have, I'm currently running two companies. I'm running a product development consultancy. So I help consumer products companies go from idea through design, engineering, and into manufacturing. Um, so I work with some of the largest companies. Then I work with startups alike. Uh, and then I have a line of activewear called Bloom Bras, which is now the most body inclusive line of sports bras on the market. And that's been going for about six years. And uh, so it's, it's very exciting being on the forefront of everything that's happening with product development, innovation, manufacturing, and all things in between. Fantastic. So why don't you tell us a little bit about how you got into this? Like, what was the spark that drove you to the startup? I love this story. So my first job out of college was with a company that made lava lamps, right? So there's only, believe it or not, at the I love time, lava lamps. Only, right? I think those are great. Lava lamps? Um, and I had the uh, the distinct honor of being their first marketing hire. So this is right out of college, bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, 22 years old. And about two or three months into my career, nothing that had to do with me, but my, um, my boss was let go. And so I didn't have necessarily guidance and being the... Uh, entrepreneurial spirit that I am, went home that weekend and created a 10-page marketing plan of all the things I wanted to do uh, with the brand and went in and knocked on the uh, president's door and said, these are the things I want to do that I think will bring in new revenue streams. And he kind of looked at me quizzically and said, fantastic. How do you want to do that? What's your budget? I said, give me a minute. That was not in my textbooks. And so <laughs> came back. And again, this predates the internet and uh, came back and said, okay, here are the things I want to concentrate on. One of the biggest ones was creating a licensing department. And I know this is a longer story, but I think it'll be interesting just for context. Um, and so licensees, licensors, both worked with the Lava brand and um, because of our level of intellectual property. So brought in companies like Coca-Cola, Harley Davidson, um, Garfield, which surprisingly had a huge follow, has a huge following, uh, and created Lava Lamps with that asset on it. Uh, and then on the flip side, um, started to talk to other folks about ways to um, create Lava Lamp, you know, stuffed pillows and pens and toys and Barbie stuff. Anyway, it was really exciting. I went to the licensing show that year and wait a second, uh, wait a second. Down. Did you say Barbie stuff? Is there like a little mini? Barbie size lava lamp, there is. or, or is, it a, is it a bar, is like had... a pink Barbie lava lamp? Which, no, which one did you go with? It was it's a lava lamp in the Barbie dream house, and it still exists today. And I, every time I see it, it brings a little flutter to my heart. Um, I'm gonna so have I, to I, I gonna have to seek that out. I gotta see a watch a video of that. Oh, I will <laughs> I will send you after this. I will send you videos. There, are, I've I have had the distinct honor in my career of working on some really fun and funny projects. I have worked on paper shredders three times in my career. So I am now uh, considered one of the experts in the space. I have worked uh, on- I didn't know you could be an expert in paper shredding, but I, I guess there's know. like different ways of shredding paper and you know, yes. like all of that. I can see how that might be something. I have worked on every category in the pet space. So from, you know, toys to, keypads to gates and everything in between to treats. Um, so it's been a really fun career. But going back to this, like the story of, of how I fell in love with product development was, um, and this dates myself, the third Austin Powers movie was about to come out. And so I met with New Line Cinema and they said, can we get Austin Powers to float around in a lava lamp? And I said, hmm, let me go back and see I have no idea. I'm not a chemist. Wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Like like a little yeah. character, like a little plastic. They wanted character. us to float <laughs> around, and I was That's like, a great idea. Oh, it's a great idea, and I just didn't know how to execute on it. So I went back to the company and I said, "Okay, so, um, you know, what can we what can we not do here?" 
Um, and nobody could give me an answer. And so I said, there's got to be a, got to be somebody R and D, something like that. And, um, of course, you know, after a lot of questions, they said, you know, there is this one woman. So after seeking her out, she was like in the dungeon of the factory and all she was doing this amazing PhD was testing and testing and testing, um, the pH levels, et cetera. And so I said, you know, let's have some fun with this. So we got into it and we actually, um, we actually started to play around to say, could we actually get Austin to float around? The answer was no, we couldn't. But if you remember the movies, there's the male female symbols. So we could get those because of the weights to go in a random motion. So anyway, Austin's team passed on it. Um, but I was like, it's still a pretty cool product. So we ended up um, buying it a bunch of different colors, hot pink and teal, et cetera, and launching it. And it brought in a whole new channel and opened up as a glitter lamp, opened up our mass market, uh, opened up a new teenage market, opened up um, some great press opportunities, and I was hooked. So that became the guiding light for the rest of my career. Wait a minute. I, I, it's tech, technically, how did you do this? I mean, we. I mean, I'm thinking this Austin Powers figure had to be made out of metal or something, right? Because it gets super hot. So, so we didn't. Like, wh what did you do? Yeah. Like, how did so you make these things? We ended up just going with a glitter lamp, so glitter floating around, so glitter flex, which are really, really lightweight. And I, I, uh, I can't disclose the secret of what makes up a lava lamp. But let's just That's say fine. you know there's chemistry involved. And so um, using the, the weight of the glitter flex in the proprietary material and everything about the way that a lava lamp is shaped is actually an engineering piece. That's why there's so much intellectual property, um, but everything from the light bulb, where the light bulb is placed to the coil, to the air bubble at the top um, helps to make it function the way it does. And, um, and so, the glitter lamp then that second year outsold the lava lamp by a, a pretty high multiple. Um, and so, you know, it was proof then to the company that, you know, that new product development was actually important. Um, and also for me, it gave me the, um, I would say the push to say, uh, you know, don't be afraid to ask a lot of questions and to get more and more people involved. So, you know, even today, when I sit down with some of my clients, one of the things that I continuously find, and, and I don't say this in a negative way, but we're all moving so fast that in a lot of organizations, innovation is siloed. So you oftentimes have somebody like the marketing department that has a date, right, saying, oh, I don't know, there's a new line review for a product, or I need to have another product up on Amazon or I have this product is failing and I need something to replace it. There's usually a driving date. And so it's a rush, right? So marketing says, all right, here's a whole bunch of ideas and they might give it to design and design whips up a whole bunch of really pretty designs. And then sales looks at it and says, I like A, D and F. And then that goes to engineering and engineering says, there's no way in heck I can actually make this thing that you wait a minute shouldn't it? engineering be in that conversation too because if it's not even possible ding, ding, ding. <laughs> right but again in theory yes and in, in execution it doesn't always work that way i would say the same thing about manufacturing manufacturing should be involved in innovation from day one manufacturing understands what's happening with materials they understand what's happening with tooling they understand if there's new trends in automation that's going to cause you know, cost reductions or time reductions. And so all of those things to me play into the product development process, but traditionally they have not necessarily been the guiding light. Yeah, I was, I, I'm, 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 I love your story. And I think Thank that you. this is great that you were, you were actually able to get them to say yes to it because it sounds like it's it was sort of like an old organization so they're they're kind of stuck in their ways. Is that, is that oh, right? I'm, Did you have any trouble pushing, think... pushing things through? I actually would say that that is, so I work with a lot of brands and, um, and I would say from the largest brands on the planet to some of the smallest startup brands, it's the same challenge. So I actually don't think it's unique to 
that particular company or any of the other companies I work with, I think that that is actually one of the biggest uh, opportunities. And that's, that's, that's why my business has, has flourished through the years is I'm not particularly good at any one thing. I'm not a designer. I'm not an engineer. I'm not a manufacturing specialist, but bringing people together and being empathetic and, and understanding of what each of them brings to the table and then having everybody work towards the same goal helps escalate product development. It helps reduce redundancy. It helps um, reduce budgets and time constraints. And, and frankly, it's a much more pleasant experience, but it's one that a lot of organizations just haven't, um, they haven't, they haven't executed on. Well, I, I find that there are, a lot of them are like, well, it's working okay the way it is. Why should we mm -hmm. change it? I mean, we've, we've got these hierarchies in place. They're Correct. all doing their thing and mm -hmm. we're still making money. So we're fine. But then as soon as, you know, bad times hit, it's like, what are we going to do? So how do you, how do you try to break through some right. of those barriers? Well, again, to me, that's, if you have a strategy, right? If you put together a product development plan and innovation plan, you know, company that does a fantastic job of this is Apple, right? And I mean, we all use Apple as I would say a, a, an example, but where they already know in their pipeline, they know what features they're going to release next. They know um, that they rely on their manufacturing partners. I'm sorry, their, their manufacturing partners to help to uh, escalate what can and cannot be done. They've got people who are working around the clock on innovation, on material sciences, on new technologies. And so when they sit down to do a product launch, it's it's already planned out many years in advance. Um, and I think as we look at some of the opportunities right now with supply chain disruption, you're seeing more and more companies that are um, that are struggling because they did not plan for this. And, and most of us that came, you know, that come from the world of supply chain um, have been screaming from the mountaintops for, for decades now that this is, that this is a problem and that we need to, we need to be more uh, um, thoughtful about our, uh, you know, about the diversification and the planning process so that we're not relying necessarily on our suppliers uh, overseas to do our innovation work, et cetera. So, yeah. um, so it's, it's a, so, it's a fun time to be in the product development space. Oh, absolutely. But I guess the question I have is that how do you bring all these people together? Do you just bring them together and then magic happens or, I mean, so it, there's a, there's no, there's no special, uh, special sauce. I think it's honestly, it's, it's taking a holistic approach. So it's looking at trends. It's looking at at like I said, planning, being under, being able to understand who, what, where, and who all the stakeholders are, and being able to be, um, you know, to have a, a strong enough relationship with each of those stakeholders where you can bring them together. You know, I, when I some of my my favorite projects that I've ever worked on, it's because we have line of sight to you know, what our customers are asking for, what consumers will purchase, and what manufacturers can produce. And so if any one of those changes, we can easily make a, a, a phone call or get everybody together and say, hey, good news, we've got some new data that we can work towards. Or, you know, with like, with what we're seeing right now, where sustainability in manufacturing is finally coming to the forefront, um, it's no longer that, uh, you know, the conversation used to be, we want to do this, but we don't really have a, a huge push. Nowadays, you're seeing consumers changing their behavior. You're seeing um, a lot more, uh, I would say, of a need versus a want for sustainability in manufacturing. And I think that's just going to continue on a trend. And it's a trend that's heading in the right direction. Yeah, it's definitely going to go there. So you say you have two businesses, right? So you have your consultancy and you also mm -hmm. have your other startup. And tell me about your other startup. Like, tell me your other yeah. startup story. All right. So I was frustrated because I could not find a sports bra that, that worked for me. And so- um, Isn't that like I, 80, 90% of women, basically? It is. 70% of women are a D cup or above. 
And the average dress size in the U.S. is between a 40, I'm sorry, is between a 14 and a 16, which is about a 44, 46 band. And if you look at any of the major brands out there, Nike, Lululemon, Under Armour, um, they all cater towards the, I would say, smaller chested and smaller boned women. Um, and I kept saying, this is so strange. If statistically we are missing, you know, at least two thirds, if not more of the population, why is nobody doing this? And so yeah, why is that? that that's a, it, that's a good question. Well, the, the reason is, and, and I'm going to, I'm going to pick on a couple of brands, not for their strategy, because I think it makes sense for them. But if you look at somebody like a Nike, who has been producing the same, essentially same sports bra for 30 years, innovation comes in changing out some materials, changing out colors, adding features like a, you know, a zipper, or a new mesh panel. Um, but they can continuously produce that same, that same bra over and over again. If you say you're not going to carry the same three pound weight with the same device as a 12 pound weight and you would bring that into bras, right? So obviously boobs is a funny subject. So, um, so we'll just throw but that it's out necessary. there. It's <laughs> necessary. These are a is. requirement. <laughs> we all have them. Um, some of them are just different shapes and sizes. And so, uh, I said, I want to approach this more as an engineering challenge versus a design law and so looking at it from a truly a, a mechanical standpoint saying if it's really about weight distribution which it is 90 plus percent of um the support from a bra uh pulls down on the front so if you think of an underwire bra with the straps um that's painful for most women and there's a lot of health risks that are involved in it i won't go there on this particular podcast but it became a, a really big passion for me to find something. So I'm I'm slender um, and and well endowed, and uh, and so for me, I was trying to figure out how I could create something that would give me the lift I wanted without some of these health issues, but also without feeling like I was wearing a suit of armor. And so, but did you did you actually bring in engineering resources to do this, I like did. actual physical uh, mechanical engineer? I guess what I kind did. of engineering would you need? Mechanical engineering, right? Or what is that? So um, I brought in some of the top minds from NASA, and shipping and packaging experts, and a woman who does all the corsetry work for Oprah and Katy Perry, but she also does all of the uh, corset work in the costumes for ballerinas and opera singers. So she was really. Um, knowledgeable, knowledgeable about materials and how um, how the body, the female body works. And so I brought them all together and said, "Let's let's have some fun with this. Here's my concepts. Here's what I am envisioning." And they helped me to bring my vision to life. And so then I went ahead and I patented it and um, went through a whole process to find a manufacturing partner uh, that resulted in me actually building my own factory in Sri Lanka um, because I wow. wanted yeah why did you have to do that things. it seems like that there were that there's lots of factories out there no. what, what was it you would think that, so yeah well what drove you to to do it yourself so I needed a, a factory I, I specifically needed a factory that would that um, could create a technical product that um, would there, there's themes on the bra that make it function the way it does. And so those were difficult to actually achieve with what's on the market right now from mass market production. And then, you know, even though I have a stellar, um, a stellar reputation in the industry, I also was coming in as a startup. And so finding somebody who would work with a startup was way more challenging, especially I wanted somebody, um, I ideally didn't want to go to China with this product for a lot of reasons. Even though that's my background, um, I wanted to find somebody uh, that that I could grow with and that um, that would take my IP seriously. And so I found somebody in Cambodia, and it was great, and it was this whole amazing experience until uh, right before we were supposed to get our first shipment, and they disappeared with my patterns and my money 
Uh, oh no! Which, yeah, it's a whole crazy story. I'll save that one for you know when I'm for for a different podcast. <laughs> we could sit down. We could talk about that one over a cocktail one day. Um, but what it did was it drove me to then um, really follow my second passion, which was sustainability and manufacturing. And I was able to connect up with a group of folks who were trying to build a factory using um, wind, water, and solar, but also using local labor. And so with Bloom Bras being the lead uh, product for them, it actually was a really good joint venture. And, and we're still in, you know, we're still working together today. Wow, that ended up being actually better for you to do it that way. I mean, was yeah, this I your mean, second choice or was were you also looking at them at the same time? So I didn't know that they existed at that time. Um, so when when everything happened with the uh, with the first factory, you know, my my three options and any of these three would have been fine. But one would have been to scream and shout and swear and threaten lawsuits and, and cry myself to sleep which I'm not saying I didn't do. Um, the second would have been- You're a startup say, founder. Everyone's gone fighting, through that. <laughs> exactly. The second one would have been, and this one, you know, like, I mean, would also have been awesome, uh, an awesome option, which would to be to say, listen, I had 240,000 people come through a Kickstarter in three weeks time without spending any money. Um, I did all the things I wanted to do. I made the prototype. I got the IP. and I'm just going to maybe try to sell it or walk away from it and be okay with that. Like maybe this was the sign I needed. Um, or the third option was get on a plane and start talking to anyone and everyone who would talk back. Um, even if it meant pushing production out for over a year and, and spending a lot of um, my time, energy, and money building the baby that I've always you know dreamed of. Uh, and, and so that was the, you know, that was the path I took. And I, I tell this to anybody who has the entrepreneurial spirit and wants to start their own company is if you are not willing to do those things, put in all of your time, all of your money, all of your effort, it's probably not your, it's probably not what you should be doing because the entrepreneurial journey is one of so many ups and downs and lefts and rights and um it is a lonely journey it doesn't matter how great your support system is uh every entrepreneur i think faces those those questions on a daily basis of is this really what i should be doing and where's the light at the end of the tunnel oh yeah absolutely you have to be all in i think if you're not all in then it's probably not gonna you're probably not gonna do very well right so, well, what, like, so this, the, what was I going to say? The, so the concept that you came up with, you came up with after, you know, personal experience. And then you said you had a Kickstarter with 250,000. I was going to say, like, a lot of times when you're building the product, building the product mm -hmm. is great and getting out the door is great. But if you don't get the audience for it, if you don't get, you know, people knowing about it. So you right. did, you, you, you pulled an audience through Kickstarter? Is that how you, is that how you pulled your audience? So I pulled my audience a couple different ways. Um, and I will say, you know, if I were to do it again today, obviously I have a lot more knowledge. Um, so when I was creating the product, I created it for myself. Um, but there were four key markets that I- Which is what a lot of entrepreneurs do. Absolutely. absolutely. <laughs> That's what they do. And honestly, it was, it wasn't ever, it was to see if I could do it. Um, and so even though I had, I had written the business plan the year out of college, which, you know, I'd like to say was a few years ago, but it was not, uh, and let's just say it years, was a few years ago. A few is, yeah, it could be anything. <laughs> yeah, it could be, it could be, right. Um, it's a loose term. Uh, but I, you know, I kept pulling the business plan out and saying the numbers are there. The market is there. I have the, I've created hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of products. So I know all the risks that are involved, which is why I didn't do it for the longest time. And then it got to this point where I was like, if I don't do this now, I'm always going to regret it. And I'm going to just do it for me. And so I set aside for myself a, a kind of a, a personal budget of money and of time. Um, I was I had a big project 
with a, a very large global brand um, that ended on November 30th. Um, and the only reason that's important is if there's any consultants uh, in your audience, you know that you don't start projects in December, you know, and, and so it was a really good time for me to take a pause, say, I'm going to give myself until the end of January or, or end of February. I'm going to go through the process. I'm going to do the exploration. I'm going to spend the money to get the prototypes. I'm going to test it. So the way I built my audience was first um, through uh, Facebook, through a couple of female founders communities. And I said, hey, I have some prototypes. I'm looking for women between these sizes to come and give me your opinion. I had 165 women show up at my apartment um, throughout a, a nice. couple of weeks. Yeah. And give me their opinions, which were, you know, coming from working with larger brands where you have budget to go out and do a big consumer research uh, or an ethnographic research or to do focus groups. That's fantastic. This one was way more telling for me. And it gave me, again, now some faces that when I actually launched, um, I could go back to and say, great news that product that you tried, here it is. Um, and when I put it out on my personal Facebook, what was crazy, and I, again, like, I still to this day, um, it makes me very emotional because when I put it out on my personal Facebook and I said, here's what I'm doing, here's what I love, and here's why I'm doing it, um, all of these people from my past uh, started sharing it. and. All of a sudden, they were sharing it. They were tagging. Then other people who I didn't know were tagging. And so I would watch at, you know, three in the morning, the numbers of the views that we were getting on, that I was getting on the Kickstarter, and then the number of sales. So I um, I had put out a goal of $20,000 to raise, and I raised that within the first, you know, within a short period of time. Wow, um, fantastic. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And Again, you know, it's like Kickstarter has changed so much since then and Facebook has changed so much since then. So it it sometimes feels dated to take that that snapshot back in time. But it was um, it was a really, you know, what when I look at it now, because the things that I was trying to understand. So there were four markets that I had identified. One was curvy women. And that could be anyone who, you know, looks like me to the more traditional. And I only use this and, you know, this this term um, in terms of, I would say, conversation for us between, you know, the audience, but the typical plus size community, which I cannot stand that word. So that's a, that's a whole different subject. Um, that whole moms, thing needs rebranding. It, it does, needs rebranding. Um, so new moms whose bodies are fluctuating, uh, breast cancer survivors, which is one of the ethos of, of the company and it's how we're named, et cetera. And then um, the fourth one being women who have gone through a big change in their life, usually around menopause and beyond, whose bodies have changed in a different way. Um, and so those were the, the women that I, I had identified as my market. And then um, within that, the question was, do you go with humor? Do you go with science and, and health? Or do you go with personal story? And so... Um, the Kickstarter gave me the opportunity to kind of try a little bit of all of it. Fantastic. And I don't have answers today and it's six years later. <laughs> well, would you say that uh, your personal network really kicked it off? Like if you hadn't had that, the, all those personal connections in that network and knew all about what was going on, then that helped to start where you were going. So I would actually say it differently. I would say that, no, I, I, had, a, I had hit a pain point literally and figuratively, uh, that many, many women, whether it was themselves or their sisters or best friends or mothers, that they were, they were, you know, they were feeling that same challenge. And we talk, right? So um, I knew even from just looking at all of the message boards out there that there were hundreds of thousands of women like me that were struggling with this. So when I ran my first half marathon, I did what so many women do, which is I wore two sports bras at once or a sports bra with an underwire bra. And at the end of the race, I had no skin left, um, you know, from the chafing and whatnot. 
And so when I took to the internet and said, what are, where, what are people doing for this? There were thousands and thousands of women asking the same question. And so my thought was, if I could be the answer to that question, I already have a built-in um, network. Oh, fantastic. So, and, and if you were to do it again today, would you still do the same, go the same route or would you do something different? I would do something different. I mean, I think, you know, the knowledge base I have now is it would have been way better to have grown the list before. It would have been, um, you know, I mean, there's so many things that I can look back and say I would do slightly different. Uh, I probably, honestly, and this is this is something that I, I have struggled with for a while, is I would have brought in a co-founder. I did it all myself. And you know, I can look back now and say, you really have all of the things. aspects that of a found, you have a founding team. Absolutely. You don't need, you don't need anybody else. Right. And that's, that's, I think the, the founder dilemma, right. Is, oh, I can do it all my, and I think, and I'm, I'm going to pick on my gender for a moment. I think as females, we also look at it and say, um, and, and I hope I'm not being offensive when I say this, but being in Silicon Valley, you see it all the time, right? A, a man walks into a room and says, I have this amazing idea. Here's a napkin with a drawing. I need $60 million. To, and this is, and, and you're going to see the 3X return in two years, blah, blah, blah. And a woman walks in. And again, these are very stereotypical. And I admit that. But we walk in and we say, I've been working on this. I've already solved it all. And I think I can do it for $600,000. But if you can't give me that, give me 200000 and I'll make that work, right? It's just, it's a different mentality. And I think- Very different. Um, when, right. When I look at what I would have different, done differently, I would have um, brought in more partners and I would have uh, grown it in a, I would say in a different way than I ended up. It's been amazing. I mean, we've got, you know, over 150,000 people on our, our, on our email list and Instagram and et cetera, um, which was all homegrown and they're all very, very engaged, which might not sound like a huge number, but when you think about the fact that it's, that I'm still self-funded and that, um, you know, that that's all been from word of mouth, it's, uh, you know, it's something that I'm proud of. I've had partnerships with Macy's and REI and Title IX and a whole bunch of other really big companies. And, and at the end of the day, we're still a direct-to-consumer brand by choice. Yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't say that that's a small number. What was it? Somebody said you have to have like 150 true fans. I think you've got 150,000 true fans, right? Yeah. yeah, which is, again, which is, it's it's when I look back and say, what you know what would i do different it, there's always going to be a big pile there but there's also several things where it's like well i took some gambles and they worked um and other ones where i took a lot of gambles that didn't work <laughs> so so this uh so what what's the next steps for you guys i mean where are you going where are you going now are you going to diversify or are you just i mean where do you go next so, so with my so I'll start with Bloom Bras. So with Bloom Bras, um, continue to grow and grow. You know we've got some pretty hefty plans for the future um, as far as products that we're going to expand into. So we're right now the size range that we cover is 28C to 56L, um, and so we have uh, plans of expansion into some larger sizes because that's our biggest request right now in colors, uh, and then we will move into um, athletic shirts, sundresses, and swim uh, using, you know, the same patented concept. And then for um, AHA Product Solutions, which is the product development consultancy, um, I get, I'm doing more and more projects right now on um, automation and bringing supply chain back to the U.S., which is exciting, or North America, I should say. Um, and then looking at ways to take some institutional brands and uh, expand holistically. Um, you know, if you look at a lot of, I would say the challenges of the brands of today is that they were pretty reliant on traditional retail channels. And I don't think retail is dead. I just think it's evolving and that consumer behavior is evolving. And um, so working with companies to be a part of the 
I would say the change versus um, resisting it has been really fun. Um, I just actually am consulting right now on a, a, a very large uh, beverage company who is trying to utilize their glass bottle recycling to uh, to build gardens. And it's what a cool project um, Fantastic. to be a part of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And another company that I'm working with right now, a, a national brand, is working on, uh, you know, a whole new direct-to-consumer project that is brand new for their organization. So it's just smaller runs, locally sourced product, and I think it's going to be really successful. And again, it's it these things fill my soul. I love it. I love it. So you were saying you're are you totally direct-to-consumer now? So you have no with bloom bras yes yeah. we have a couple of um specialty shops that carry the product but one of the things that i found with retail specifically with with this particular um line of product was that um they didn't quite understand how to sell the, the product so i'm gonna i'm gonna give an example and i won't say the retailer's name um, but when I went and did a tour of all of the, we did a bunch of pop-up stores within the stores. And when I went to one of the stores in Atlanta, Georgia, which is a very big market for us, uh, I walked in and they had three men working the department. And um, because it was innovative new brands, it wasn't specific to sports bras. And I said, well, I hate to say this, but... It, a man probably right now is not going to be the per, the, the right person to uh, speak to a, a, an innovative new solution for sports bras for larger breasted women. Um, and, you know, he looked at our marketing materials and he said, I can't put these out there. They showcase pornography. And I said, pornography? What do you mean? So if you look at the okay. if you look at our website, right, if you look at our website, there's a woman in a sports bra. And, and leggings and he said yeah this is you know this is pornography I can't put this out here in Atlanta Georgia and, and I said you're selling sports bras this is a sports bra and he said yeah but you know our, our customers wouldn't understand that and that was a really big you know I I that made me so angry right and so that I, is really you know, strange I can't imagine right. that and this is a this is a national retailer that a very big one uh that you know, that that was that was one of the big challenges. And so for me, rather than making the investment into retail, it became more make the investment into uh, better social media. So if you look at our Instagram, for instance, it's all about diversity and it's all about feeling good. Like the, the mission of Bloom Bras, our, our statement that anybody who works with us or for me um, eats breathes and, and lives is the mission of Bloom Bras is to empower women of all shapes, sizes, and stages of life to feel good while they're moving. And I think that's, you know, if if there's nothing else that, um, you know, that we do in life, if, if nobody else buys the bras, that's okay, as long as the people who do feel that mission and breathe that mission. Excellent. Is there no, have you had any kind of uh, issues with being a uh, direct to consumer? Because this oh. is a clo this is basically a clothing brand, right? People yes. would be like, I got to try it on. I know for me, it's like, I want to, you know, I'd love to buy stuff online, but I'm like, I really want to try it on before I, before I, I buy it. So is that, has that been an issue? Um, so we offer free returns, free exchanges. Um, if anybody calls somebody from our team, picks up or calls that person back and walks them through sizing, um, sizing is by far the hardest challenge. Same thing with returns. We used to take returns. Nowadays, um, with most returns, we actually just have them donate it um, because it's a more sustainable, uh, you know, better for the environment. Um, also, getting bras back, oftentimes, you, you know, they're not reusable. Um, and so if it's unopened and it's not touched in a package, you know, we, we, I'm happy to take it back, but that took a lot of years of learning. Um, and it took a lot of years of trying different things, uh, playing around with our sizing calculator, uh, showing as many different women of different sizes and shapes. So if you were to put 10 women who are all 
let's just say a 38 triple D next to each other, they're going to look different. They're going to feel different. They're going to have different desired outcomes from the bra. You know, my younger gals might want more of a lift. My older women might, might want more comfort. And so um, it's, it's been more about empathy and understanding what our consumer wants and then making sure our messaging and our sizing reflects that. Excellent. Yeah. Cause I always thought some, these kind of, these kind of brands have, would have a tough time selling online, but it sounds like you, you've, you've dealt with that. Yeah. And I mean, the other really big challenge, frankly, right now with, um, you know, with being a direct to consumer brand is we used to be very reliant on, on things like, Facebook and Instagram who have unfortunately changed the algorithm so that small businesses don't, uh, it has, it has affected our business pretty drastically because we don't want to be on Amazon right now. And, uh, and so, um, it, the, the cost per acquisition for customers has skyrocketed. So if you look at some of the big companies that uh, direct to consumer companies that have raised, and I, you know, I'm sure that most folks, again, within your audience um, can follow along with the media. Uh, so I don't have to name the brands, but that raised a lot of money or IPO'd or opened up tons and tons of retail locations across the country. They are all getting just destroyed right now and imploding because frankly, the, they're, um, need to grow faster and faster and faster. Um, the consumer demand just isn't there, and it's and and so it's not a sustainable business model for me and for you know for Bloom Bras. We've got a very high repeat purchase rate, way 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 above what the industry standard is, and so I'd much rather be more focused on um, working with our consumer base and our community and creating products that they will continuously buy and replace um, and love forever versus um, going after, again, the the mass quantities. Well, yeah, so I mean, you are, it is sort of a, it is sort of a premium product, right? I mean, you're not, it is. You're, you are positioned there. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Okay. So it's time to think like a future. It's the year 2032. It's 10 years from now. Where will you be? What will you be, are you going to be trying on trying on bras in the metaverse or no 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 I think you know what I mean I mean I want to continue to grow bloom bras you know my my goal is to again with with that community is to continue to build out products it's not going anywhere I mean if you look at um, you look at the numbers they continue to rise on all fronts that I had mentioned right so there's one in eight women right now is a breast cancer survivor or has dealt with sorry has dealt with breast cancer. Um, there are over 3 million new moms, uh, you know, that come into the population every year. Uh, the, the curvy community continues to grow with, unfortunately, girls, um, uh, facing puberty at younger ages. So their bodies are, are evolving in a different way, you know, and so for me, um, I am, I feel like this is just the tip of the iceberg. So I want to continue to grow Bloom Bras. And then on the flip side, when I look at all of the opportunities right now in supply chain and building out factories, I mean, you see now all the institutional brands are investing in um, some sort of manufacturing here in the United States. That's been, that was unheard of 10 years ago. Um, but I think that there's a huge amount of opportunity with automation and with waste redundancy and really looking at sustainability as a true um, company motive instead of as something that's really good for PR. Uh, I'm excited to see what's happening there. And so I really want to be on the forefront of that. Um, and then, you know, enjoying life. Right? And we have, we who live in uh, California, I think have a, a, uh, the benefit of being able to say, I'm going to go out hiking every day. I'm going to go out and enjoy nature. And one of the things when I left corporate America that I would say uh, became a, a big motive for me was to be able to enjoy something uh, out in nature every single day. Yeah. That's the one thing I, I noticed about some entrepreneurs. It's like they've left corporate, they, they've worked really hard in corporate America and then they go do their own business and they work really hard and they don't spend any time, you know, 
resting or whatever. I mean, you're only at your best when you've balanced it all out. So for me, and, and I don't, I don't, I don't say that this is a strategy for everyone, but I am a list maker. And so I have on my calendar every day, I, I get up early. I am a 4.40 AM wake upper. Uh, and oh, so, so you I beat have... me. I'm only a 5 AM wake upper. I gotta, I gotta adjust my, <laughs> you should, you should come on. We'll do the 4.40. Um, and I, I have 20 minutes where I meditate and do my little gratitude practice. And then I try to, I, I like to jump right in. I like to address my emails first thing. And then by mid morning, I will always, always, always schedule time to either go for a walk or run or do a yoga practice because that's what stimulates my brain. And if I don't build that time in, I know that I will get sucked in to, you know, to whatever is next. I also have a, a really big, um, like for me personally, I make sure that on my to-do list every day is something that doesn't have to be addressed today. So whether that be, you know, sitting down and saying, what are my, what are my goals for the next 12 months? Um, or, you know, reaching out to somebody in my network that maybe I haven't talked to in a long time. I make sure that there's something like that, that I do every single day, because again, it, it takes me away from um, being sucked in. Otherwise, I mean, there were times where I was working 20 plus hours a day, especially with, um, with some of my clients that, you know, that I was back and forth to China with. I mean, I remember times where I was on 24 hours of conference calls um, because I was in China and so I was working all day with my, my teams there. And then I was on the U S based and then the Ireland based calls all oh, night. Yikes. And, and I think about what that did to my psyche. And I think about what that did to me physically and, um, burnout is a real thing. And I think as entrepreneurs, it's a different type of burnout. So my burnout comes from, I can't, I, if I'm staring at my p and um, and I'm staring at my massive to-do list, I'm going to get nothing done. And so it's really being able to understand, um, you know, what, what my, how my brain works and then how I'm going to be the most productive. One of the things that happened for me when we got shut down, right, when, when we all went into lockdown, it was the first time in my entire career where I didn't travel. And so all of a sudden for three months, I had the ability to slow down and to really look. And when I looked at the profitability of my businesses and I looked at my hiring practices and I really did a breakdown, it turned out that things were not as they appeared. And so it, forced me to make some really big changes and you know those have paid off in some ways over the last couple of years but I know that they'll pay off even more as my um, you know over the next 10 years of my life yeah so it actually turns out for a lot of things it was a bit of a blessing because it forced people to yeah. pause and think yeah. I mean that's why you had the great resignation and and all these people going yeah. is this really what I want to do with the rest of my life do I want to keep doing this the way it is and if it wasn't for that then people would have just kept kept churning it out right well it's funny because even even now i would say not a day goes by that i don't get a a ping from somebody saying hey i'd love to pick your brain i've got this great idea and you know i want to i want to see how i could go about making it happen and some of these folks are, are folks that, you know, have been in corporate America for 30 plus years, others that are 22 coming out of college. And I, I've had to be a little bit more cautious because I said yes to everybody for a long time. Um, well, because the ideas are great, right? They're great Most ideas, the right? These are really great and you want to be involved. And, Right. And by the way, nobody wants to admit that their baby is not the most beautiful baby in the world. Um, and, and so, you know, so I think true. as right, as an entrepreneur, you look and you say, okay, well, you know, some of these are beautiful babies and others probably will grow into pretty adults, but <laughs> <laughs> love it.
So I wanted to ask one more thing about the future, though. Yes, I mean, since you since you are a direct consumer, have you ever thought of sort of somehow because right now we have these sort of demarcations, this size, this size, this size, this yep. size, but everybody is different. Every human being is different. Mm -hmm. Have you looked into any time type of sort of mass customization where you can just have people use some kind of tools to measure things and then have have them built to spec? So there are a lot of, I will say, gimmicky um, technologies out there. So specifically with bra sizing, um, the female body changes 10% throughout a month naturally. So that's without any sort of, you know, crazy change in, in, um, in our bodies. So if you're B cup, not a big deal. If you're a triple D, that's actually a full cup size. And that's going to be very different from one person to the next person. And so, you know, for the females in your audience, they, they are nodding their heads for sure. Um, to say that's why certain clothing fits us differently throughout, throughout a month. And with bras, it's even more so, um, uh, relevant. So when I see all of these companies coming out with sizing tools or with, um, sizing calculators, I wish them the best of luck, but they're not, they're not being realistic to who the, you know, who the, or what the female body does. And so I still believe that, um, that in person will come back for us. We were doing prior to shutdown, we were doing several pop-ups a month and they are very resource heavy and they're amazing because it gives us the opportunity. It gives me the opportunity to speak to our consumers and to work through all the sizing. And it's amazing. And I, I, I can't wait to get back to it. But when I looked at profitability, it actually is what killed the business as well. So if I look at each of those and I and I put a sale, an LTV, right, a lifetime value, each of those sales, it actually paid off. But when I look at the short term, the customer customer acquisition cost of a pop up, it was extremely extremely high, and um, and so short term versus long term. Um, I think it'll just be a different strategy for me moving forward. That's interesting because um, do you find that those are more long-term customers, the ones that you have started off with a, with a pop-up or? Yes. Or, okay. Yeah. So they, they did stay longer. They yeah, did I was stay thinking longer. Of, uh, in, the, sat, in, the men's, in the men's custom-made suits area, it's like, you know, you can go somewhere and get measured and then they send your measurements off to China or whatever, and then the suit gets made and it brings back. I mean, that particular model wouldn't work for you either because of the same issue, right? You've got the amount of the costs involved in doing the the measurement, right? Well, there's so so there's two things there. One is um, if you're talking, if we were to to do a custom made bra, which is possible, that bra would be over. Two hundred and fifty dollars. Um, we looked. I looked into it, right? So if I were to do it, that's two hundred and fifty dollars. I'm not saying that, but it would be the best bra anyone ever wore. No, I'm just kidding. Right, right. <laughs> so instead, um, the way that the bra is designed is that everything is adjustable. So it's adjustable straps. It's adjustable cups. Um, the back is designed so the seams will will expand and contract with the body. Um, there is a zipper in the front so that again it makes it. Um, easier to cinch together and to to give the feeling of weightlessness instead. Um, and so, rather than than making a two hundred and fifty dollar custom bra, I tried to make something that would adjust with each of our bodies. Well, that makes a lot more sense. I don't know. <laughs> that's exactly probably the right way to do it. So that's great. Anything else? Uh, any other things or like future things that you're thinking might might be happening in, in about ten years? I mean, I think there's so much. It's such an exciting time, right? I think um, consumer behavior is changing quite a bit. I think you're seeing more of a demand for locally sourced. I think you're seeing a lot more demand for um, for products that have more thought behind them, um, high quality. So I'll give you an example, right? When my parents got married 51 years ago, 50, yeah, 51. Wow. Uh, they got a coffee maker and th that coffee maker was steel 
and it, you know, it chugged and chugged and it still works today. Probably a little rusty, but it still works today. Um, fast forward where we have been, if I wanted to go and buy a coffee maker today, I could walk into any of the major retailers and for $29 or whatnot, I'll buy a coffee maker. If it breaks in nine months, I throw it away, I get another coffee maker. That, we don't think about what happens, right? The, where does that coffee maker go? It goes to a landfill. If I'm buying five coffee makers over the next five years, wouldn't it be better to buy that nicer steel one that cost me $350. Instead, it's a better cost for value. Um, but I don't think that we've gotten there as consumers yet. I think we're getting there and I'm really excited to be a part of that. Um, the first part of my career, I worked on planned obsolescence. I worked with all of the major brands to help them figure out how to make products cheaper and how to hold space, you know, year after year so that somebody wants to come in and buy the next big blah 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 and um i think as this next generation of consumers comes out it's saying i would rather spend the money and have something that's going to last me for a long time um it puts more onus back on the brands to create products that don't necessarily die after nine months um the problem the problem is is that all these business models are predicated on the planned obsolescence right yeah. uh they, they would need to they would need to figure out how to make these things last forever because i have one of these coffee makers technovorm it's 400 it's like 300 or something like that mm -hmm. and it works exactly the same way as one of the cheaper ones but i know it's going to last forever and right. we just have to we just have to get these organizations to to realize that you know this is probably more like what people want. We don't want to fill landfills. We want more sustainable. We want things to last forever. And I mean, I mean, my parents were like, w their stuff lasted forever. We want, right. I think we want our stuff to last forever too. Well, and, and then on that same level, right? So as consumers, we've gotten so used to um, saying, okay, I need a, I need a, a, a dress for something. So I'll go on to Amazon and I'll buy 10. And I'll get them and I'll try them all on and I'll keep the one that works and I send them back. Well, let's think about the environmental impact of that, right? So it went from factory to a DC to an Amazon DC to your house. Then it's going back to all those. And most of those products, once they're opened, they're considered trash. So they go to a landfill. And we don't want to admit that, right? Because like, I love the convenience of being able to order all those things, try them out at home and send them back. Um, but as a small business owner, I can tell you, I can't take most of the product back. I can't reuse it. I can donate it or I can, you know, which is what most companies will do now, throw it away. I don't want to have to have the, the, I don't want to clean it and sanitize it to donate it. And by the way, China and India won't take our trash anymore. So all of those things, right? Those, those are all things that we, our generations, right? We, we didn't grow up with Amazon, but now it's in our face and we love the convenience of it. But I think this next generation is going to be paying for the sins of that, right? So now we have to be able to say, okay, so rather than um, buying those 10 dresses from Amazon, um, how do I, as a consumer, be more environmentally responsible? Yeah, yeah. And the thing is, it's because all those costs are eaten by somebody else that we yeah. don't we don't think about it. We think about, okay, I can get all these dresses for ten dollars, but you don't see all the hidden costs behind there because they're yeah. eaten by somebody else. If you if you were penalized, then people might say, oh, you know, maybe I won't do that. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Thank you so much. This has been great. Um, what's the best way to get in touch with you if somebody wants to? I mean, either one of my uh, either one of my companies. So Bloom Bras is probably the easiest one. That's B L O O M B R A S. So any email that is sent to Bloom Bras or hello at Bloom Bras or find us on Instagram um, will at some point make its way to me. Uh, 
And then LinkedIn or whatnot. I'm just Elise K, E-L-Y-S-E-K-A-Y-E. And I try to get back to anybody who reaches out to me. Sounds great. And I'll, I'll put all your uh, contact information in the show notes. And I do need that video. You got to send me that lava lamp, lamp video. <laughs> I'll, I'll have to find that. it. I'll have to find it. <laughs> you know, I have so many funny stories of my years in, in this space. Um, at some point, I feel like I need to just compile it all and I don't know, make a book. Yeah, you should write a book or something like that. But we'll, we'll yeah, have you on again. In my time, in my free time. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Talk to you soon.